And it went from the school board being a blessing to Walmart, to blessing Walmart now. Amen. Because that's where, yeah, the dollar store, you're right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Grab, grab the person's hand next to you, and we're going to pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the increase of the word of the living God in their life. We thank you most of all, Lord, for opening up their understanding. Holy Spirit, we surrender to you. Thank you, Lord. We bless you and we give you praise that your word would so feed us this morning that we can say what Jesus said. I have meat that you know not of. Thank you for feeding your people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. I had the opportunity this morning and it just kind of Everything just worked out real good. Man, I tell you, it was a good morning this morning. I was able to go in my backyard, and I got this oak tree. It's a water oak, and this thing, I have to cut it ever so many years. It, it extends out, and it creates a wonderful canopy. So I put me a chair under there, and I sat out and just started praying unto the Lord. You know, the sun was coming up and all that. And you know something that the Spirit of God quickened to me? That when something, when light is shown on something, it reveals everything. You know, when you begin to think about light, you know, you'd be th you think about something positive, etc. But when light comes, it throws a light on and exposes everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and, but it comes for a reason so that you can see the good and you can recognize the bad and you can get rid of the ugly. But that's light. Light, listen to me. Look at somebody and tell them light doesn't discriminate. It doesn't. It doesn't. Sometimes in our thinking, you know, we think, well, lights come. All right, praise the Lord. But sometimes that light come to show you what's going on in your life, and it's not necessarily good. But it is good because God is showing it to you so that you can do something about it. Isn't that wonderful? Come on, if, if it's not wonderful for you, I need to pray for you. I'm telling you, it's wonderful. Because sometimes there are things in our life that we don't see. And the light reveals it and uncovers it so you can do something about it. So praise the Lord. Now listen. Um, <clears throat> I, I taught on this on Wednesday night. I'm going to expand on it this morning. Uh, so it may not be uh, uh, long, but it's going to be effective. Um, and give you kind of the background of it. And I told you this on Wednesday night, that, that in, in seeking the Lord, the Lord spoke to my heart concerning word of hope, that we were young and that we need um, to teach on faith. And so when he says teach on faith, he began to deal with my heart. And I just want to tell all the ministers that are in the house uh, that you're going to have an opportunity to do this. So you may as well start studying on faith. Amen, missionary. Okay. I'm, I'm, now, don't come tell me when I call you up and say, listen, I want you to minister on Sunday or Wednesday. And I want you to minister on faith. Well, Pastor, I didn't know. Yes, you know now. I'm giving you forewarning to be studying on it. Amen. You said, well, Pastor, what you want us to study? I want you to study some basic things about faith because I'm going through some basic things about faith. Basics, fundamentals. Amen. Fundamentals are important. Listen to what I'm telling you. Fundamentals are important. Uh, as you know, I played football a long time, and when you reach the professional level, when you reach the professional level, that level, you have to have highly mastered the fundamentals. Meaning that whatever is foundational, you have it down pat. You don't have to go read it. Nobody have to teach you. Listen, when you get to that level, they normally don't teach you, I'm talking about in football, how to block and tackle. That's fundamentals. You already know that. They teach you other stuff. Now, some of them have to go back to it because sometimes where people come from, they wasn't taught and not well versed in fundamentals. They just had the ability. 
And you see, sometimes that's the way it is in church. We're not taught the fundamentals, but we, we think we're all that because we got anointing. But I'm going to tell you, that anointing will cause the supernatural to happen, but what is going to establish you is being rooted and grounded in the fundamentals. Because there is going to come a dark day in your life. Now, I'm not prophesying anything. That's what the Word says. You're going to go through it. But guess what? You can be prepared, and if you follow the Scriptures, look, read Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 talks about giving, and it talks about giving yourself. But it says something that is so wonderful. It says your dark day will be like noonday. Isn't that wonderful? I don't know about you, but that's what I want my dark day to be. Amen. So that's what I'm believing for. That's what I'm working for. Okay. Praise the Lord. Let me see if I can get myself oriented here and, and we'll begin to uh, flow. Sorry I disappeared on you. Uh, I'm back. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. I should have did a commercial while I was up there, but, you know, praise the Lord. It's all good. Amen. Amen. So, since the Lord wants to deal with us collectively about faith, we begin where God was speaking. Uh, God was calling us and is working in us as a governing church. Now, listen to what I'm about to say. God is doing that. And he's working that in more than one church. Now, I'm talking about literally the location, okay? He's doing it in more than one church. He's actually causing his body and those collective groups of people, if they will listen to him, he is causing them uh, uh, to rise up and to be that governing force in the heavenlies. Now, what do we mean? When we say a governing church, I don't have it up here, but I'll give it to you. A governing church um, is a local church where divine activity takes place. Divine activity takes place. Where there's a, uh, there is a spiritual position for kingdom influence. There's a spiritual position for kingdom influence. One, divine activity takes place, and there's a spiritual position for kingdom influence. In other words, God takes those people and put them in situations and circumstances, in other words, positions, okay, to bring forth the kingdom of God principles to influence people. Because there's a lot of stuff going on out there, but you are armed and pregnant with the principles of the kingdom of the living God. A different way of living. Are you listening to me? And the darker the days, the more glorious this, this way of living is going to be. Now, one of the things you must, listen, one of the things you must understand about this is you do not want to keep running from pillar to post. Because in our time, there is so much on social media going on. There's so many various different things going on in churches. Amen. You need to stay planted. Look at somebody and say, stay planted. Stay planted. It's amazing in the world of horticulture, they don't have to teach stay planted because they know you got to put something in the ground and you got to leave it there. Only human beings go against this principle. We get a little food here. We jump up and think, look, we get a little steak here. We think we can go over here and get the potatoes. We think we can go over here and get a salad. We think we can go over here. What else we need? We go get some tea, we, you know, dessert. We think we can get all that, but stay planted. Get in the, in the river and stay planted. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so what God is doing, he's dealing with his church and people that are willing to listen. Th this is not my doctrine. This is from the word of the living God. This is what God is saying. He is looking to raise up his people that they may govern in the heavenlies. Because we have already been given that position 
Amen. According to Ephesians 2.10, somewhere in that area. Uh, and uh, we've been given that position. But what God is doing, he's waking his church up to cause them to know you have that position. Amen. Amen. So what does a governing, well, I, I was saying uh, a local church, a governing church is uh, where divine activity takes place. There's a spiritual position for, the king, for kingdom influence. Uh, another one, it works to keep the heavens open. Work to keep the heavens open. There is literally an on-purpose effort toward the presence of God and creating an atmosphere for the presence of God. And I think we need to be a little more strict concerning that. I think we need to, we, we need to, we need to uh, declare the presence of God when people come to the door. Whether it be glad to see you, enter into the house of the Lord, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Because you know how we are, and sometimes we're religious. And, and we get in our car, and if we have children... We fuss, we cuss, we swing at them, we do everything. And then when we get to the house of the Lord, we become sanctimonious. Oh, look at, they're just little angels. Oh, I just speak all the good stuff over them. They're just a blessing. When you then spoke all kind of nasty words over them. Are you listening to me? Yes. Amen. Come on. We, we, we look forward to being what God has called us to be, whether we are in the house or out of the house. And stop being an outhouse. Now, some of y'all will catch that later. All right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Keep the heavens open. And lastly, um, um, a conducive, produce an atmosphere conducive for the Holy Spirit to move. Produce an atmosphere conducive for the Holy Spirit to move. That's what a governing church is. What does it look like? What does it look like? Um, Maybe I'll venture off into uh, these two, four, six, seven different things of what it looks like, okay? But this is what it looks like and the way we are rolling. Number one, it is healthy. And I'll just give you all seven of them, but I'm going to rest, as you see, on the first one, healthy. It is healthy. That's number one. Uh, the congregation is fulfilling their role functions, their role functions, whatever gifts of the Spirit is operating in that house, has been deposited in that house, they are fulfilling those, okay? Uh, they're moving toward maturity, moving toward maturity, okay? They're warm through fellowship. In other words, if I ask you and ask you to raise your hand, how many of you have been to a church where they're not warm? I know. They're just not warm. Okay? They are also solid. They have solid character through discipleship. Solid character through discipleship. I'm amazed that when you get in the Word of God and you start to look at what Jesus majored on, take a look at the church and see the church is majoring on the same thing. A lot of times they're not. But, but he's changing that. Amen. Solid character through discipleship, sincere and passionate through worship, sincere and passionate through worship. And then lastly, they are growing and sending, growing and sending, growing and sending. I uh, planted three watermelon plants in my garden. And this was uh, what's called the sugar baby watermelon. They are that dark olive green color and they're round. Two of the plants died. One lived. And the one that lived, it vine ran maybe about four feet and produced a small melon about that size. Wasn't that big. I mean, the melon itself, if it was full, it would be this big. Uh, so since it produced that, I haven't cut it yet, but I'm going to cut it open for one reason and one reason only. What do you think the reason is? Say it again. Boy, y'all on this morning. Praise the Lord. Y'all good for seeds. Because I know, like I know, like I know, that those seeds has much potential in them. Much potential. You, you're listening to me. Much potential. 
I only put three plants in the ground. Two of them died. And out of the one plant that lived, I got one little, it, it's little bitty melon. I'm going to open that bad boy up, take the seeds out, let them dry out. And when it comes time again, I'm going to put them back in the ground. I'm telling you, this is a good principle for you to understand. This is the power of seed time and harvest. You see, a lot of times, if you don't be mindful and give attention to the seed you have sown, your harvest can come and you won't even recognize it. Did y'all hear what I just said? The birds will steal it. Two years ago, and and I'll get on with it. Two years ago, I had a fine harvest on my persimmon tree. But I wasn't alert to harvest time. And two things happened. The birds ate most of it. The rest of it fell to the ground. And one thing I don't like is fruit to fall to the ground. That's a horrible thing. After you done dug it and cultivated it and watered it and, and spoke words, uh, you know, uh, fate over that thing. Man, I, listen, I speak to my ground at my house. I don't know what you do at your house, but I speak to my ground. My ground is blessed. So I, on my desk, even right now, I got a bag of persimmons. I'm, I'm watching them now. The birds, it's on. Because I sit in my chair, listen, you know, I told you earlier, I was praying out there. I sit in my chair right next to that persimmon tree. Now, I'm not there all the time, but at least they know somebody is coming. It's just, it's just, I'm, I'm just telling you, this is thinking of harvest. This is what, what needs to be done. Okay, now, let's roll. Okay. Healthy. 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 The Lord wants us healthy. Okay, uh, look at Ephesians 4.16. Put, put that up there, and I'll read it from the NLT. I have it on my sheet, NLT. It says, under his direction, under Christ's direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly at, as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow, help, help the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Healthy, healthy is, is the first principle of what a uh, governing church looked like, healthy. Good fruit, Ephesians 4.16, you see it up there, okay? It's healthy, has to be healthy. Uh, Wednesday night, as you see here, we talked about those things that, that causes us to be uh, physically uh, healthy. We talked about eating right, junk in, junk out, healthy stuff in, healthy stuff out, Amen. No, that's not all of y'all. Y'all not convinced. Come on. Is it not junk in, junk out, Sis Crystal? I have this thing going with Sis Crystal, and I thank thank God that she's moving on. I I would always see her eat these, what you call it, rice patties. Rice cakes. Rice cakes, thank you. Now, I have not had the thrill of eating newspaper, but I would would imagine... (laughs) That rice cakes is pretty close to it. But we talked about, we talked about, in order to be healthy, we got to eat right. The word. And, and we brought it over in the spiritual realm. We talked about eating right, we, the word of God. We talked about exercise. Exercise represents, in the realm of the spirit, represents being a doer of the word. These things keep us healthy. Look, sleep, sleep. Some of us not Convinced that sleep will cause us to be healthy. How many of you, on a consistent basis, get nine hours of sleep? Raise your hand. Nine hours. Come on. We got to have one nine. Says Diane. Days off. Okay. All right. How many of you get less than five hours? Less than five. Five or less. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's where a lot of us are. And and I'm kind of back and forth. I'll I'll get uh, I'll get five, I'll get three. I've had two and a half. I've had four. Man, I've squeezed out. One time I squeezed out six and a half. My body didn't know what was happening. See, rest in the Lord. 
These things make you healthy, but these things also make you spiritual health. We talked about drinking water, the word again. We talked about checkup, that, that, that's, that's proactive. We talk about washing, which is a renewing. All these things make you healthy. We brought it over and talked about this, um, you know, in the realm of the spirit. And so uh, we gave you this, anything that functions produces results. It's effective. Are you listening to me? Anything that functions produces results. Now, what uh, in order for us to become healthy here, spiritually so, as a governing church, healthy, we must partake of, we must understand, we must live by works of faith. Works of faith. I want you to think about this. Say this with me. Works of faith. Say work of faith. Okay. All right. Now, I want you to recognize and understand something about faith. Let me whip out my, we'll go with this color. It looks good. Okay. You ready? Let's go on a quick trip. He'll put the scriptures up, but I'm going to roll through them pretty quick. Ready? Okay. 2 Corinthians 1, 24. Okay? That last part. For by faith you stand. For by faith you stand. By faith you stand. Galatians 2.26. Galatians 2.26, we are justified, how? By faith and not by works of the law, okay? We are justified by faith and not by works of the law. There we go. What did I have? Two, two, I had 2.26, it's 2.16? Yes. All right, so change that, praise the Lord, 2.16. Thank you, Joe, appreciate it. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith. Not by sight. Okay? Galatians 5, 6. Faith working what? Are you getting this faith walk? I'm just trying to get you to see some of these things about faith. See how major it is. Okay? All right? Philippians 3.9. Our righteousness, which is from God, by faith. Our righteousness, which is from God, by faith. Okay? Hebrews 10.38. Now the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Now do you think faith is major in our life? Yes. Amen. Come on. Now if I'm boring you, stand up. Shake yourself out. I don't mind. Because I'm not in charge. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay. So what do we have here? 2 Corinthians 1.24, we stand by faith. 2 Corinthians 5.7, we walk by faith. Galatians 2.16, we're justified by faith. Galatians 5.6, faith works through love. Philippians 3, 9, our righteousness, which is from God, is by faith. Hebrews 10, 38, the just shall live by faith. Amen? It is about faith. Are you listening to me? Now, let's deal with this side of it, the work of faith, a work of faith. 
Okay? So, we want to, first of all, change colors. Praise the Lord. I told you I like colors. And we're dealing with 1 Thessalonians. We dealt with this the last time, 111. I'm sorry, 1, um, 2, and 3. We give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. And then verse 3. Remembering without ceasing, the first thing it talks about, your work of faith. First of all, let's, let's just say this. What is a work? Let me just write this here. Work of faith. What is a work? A work is simply this. It is an action. That's important for you to see. It is an action, a deed, an activity. Okay? That's what a work is. Okay, now, uh, according to uh, what we're dealing with, uh, this work is uh, that which is produced okay that which is produced by your effort okay that which is produced by your effort okay put a comma there your hard work Okay, and lastly, your life. Okay, so a work is something that is action. It's something that you do, a work of faith, a work of faith. Now, the Bible talks about works, works with an S of the flesh. Y'all want to look at that for a moment? Joe put up uh, Galatians, I think it's 519. Now, <clears throat> the same word that you're going to see that is used here as a work, as work of faith, is the same words right here. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are. Now, I want you to see the action. Okay, let's do this. What action we're we talking about when we say adultery? Okay. All right. Mm. Okay. Outside of marriage. And it doesn't matter whether the partner that you're committing is married or not. It doesn't matter. So then what is fornication? Okay. Are y'all up on this side? Okay. Praise the Lord. Okay. All right, you have uncleanness, you have lewdness. Go to the next verse. Ah, uh, no, we, 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 you let me preach. Thank you. I know you wanted to know, but that's why I'm giving y'all time to look them up when you get a chance. These are all, you see right here, we call a work of faith. This is a work of the flesh. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred. Contentions is a work of the flesh. Uh-huh. When was the last time y'all were contentious? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a work of the flesh. Jealousies. Outbursts of wrath or anger. Outbursts of anger. You with me? Selfish ambitions. Dissensions. Okay, watch this. What's the difference between contentions and dissensions? The difference is simply this. Dissensions is sent to divide. Contentions is just giving hell all the time. I'll just be blunt with you, okay? All right? 
heresies. Next verse. Envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the key to this, the key to this verse is who practice, who practice it. Are you listening to me? Because some of these things you got to repent of. Some of these things you got to take care of within yourself. Like, let me, let me put this to you, and, and I'm throwing this for the guys. Guys, there is nothing more serious, nothing more serious than adulteries. And when I say adulteries, I include pornography. Because looking at pornography is committing adultery. Is it not? Just in case if you don't know, I come to tell you it is. And it's evil. And it's wicked. Because it is against God's covenant. And listen, you're not reading your word if you are feeling like, if you are dealing with adultery and you're not dealing with it in your mind and in your heart. You got to deal with it. Because the Lord says, they that participate in that, he will not count you innocent. Okay, maybe you don't understand it that way. That sounds like the Yoda way of saying it. You know what I'm talking about? Yoda in Star Wars. Well, he said things backwards. In other words, when God says he will not count you innocent, God says to you, you're not you. There's no way that I am going to put a checkbox in the innocent box. And you listen. And, and get me, maybe you want to take me to task on this. The blood of Jesus covers every sin except the ones that you're not repenting of. Now, if you think you can walk with the Lord with that kind of sin in your life, I come to tell you, the God of heaven, thank God he has mercy. But I'm telling you, he's going to take care of it, and he will not count you innocent. I'm talking to the guys now. Okay, I'm just talking to the guys. I, I'm just telling you guys, listen, this stuff is wicked. It's wicked. That's why, listen, this is why I'm on this. But we are talking about, that's the work of the flesh. Well, if, if the flesh can do that, destroy you. In other words, who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What do you think a work of faith is going to do for your life? It's going to cause you to inherit the kingdom of God. It is going to bring a lot of things, all the things that God has for you, to you. Let me, let me move on. Let me move on. Okay. Paul had a thing for the Thessalonians. You know, you have your Bible, you know, they have the, the chapter captions, and you can go study it somewhere. Uh, he, he really, really wanted to encourage them. And in this verse, go back, go back to 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, 1, 3, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. Uh, notice what he says, work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. You know, in uh, Corinthians, what is it, Corinthians 13? They talk about these three. What are these three things it talks about? Faith, hope. Say it again. Faith, hope, and love. Say it again. Faith, hope, and love. Mm -hmm. The greatest of these three is love. But what God is doing to bring us to a place and mature us, he wants us to deal with the work of faith. Now, now, the reason why we're there is simply because a lot of times we do a work for God, but it's not a work from, that rises from faith. It, it sometimes rises from the flesh. It sometimes rises from selfishness. It sometimes rises from envy. The reason why you're doing a thing is to show off. It doesn't have anything to do with faith. God wants to grow us up so that we do a work of faith. Not a work in anything else, but a work of faith. Amen? Amen. Okay, now, um, also here in, uh, let's see, we're here. The other one, uh, Thessalonians, 
2 Thessalonians 1, 11. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. We pray. Notice, notice this. He says, uh, we pray always for you that our God would count you, first of all, worthy of this calling, this calling to be generous, this calling uh, uh, to be uh, open, to have your whole life open unto him, this calling, and then to fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, but also the work, the work of faith with power, the work of faith with power, the work of faith with power. If you want to invoke the power of God, if you want to decree and declare the power of God, let it be a work of faith. Amen? Okay. What is, what is a work of faith? Okay. You can take this down. I don't know if I can write it all up here. A work of faith is, it's marked by faith. I can put it up there. It's marked by faith. In other words, you can have a lot of things on the paper, but you got a check mark by something that is, that is special. It is marked by faith. It is marked by faith, okay? Put a comma here. It springs what? Springs from faith. Okay. Another thing, it's a work that is sustained. It's sustained by faith. See, sometimes we, we, we want to do things and we declare things and it's, it is sustained by our effort to pray about them. It's sustained by our effort to be in devotions. It's sustained by some human effort. It's got to be sustained by faith. Now, sustained by faith, it's prompt. By faith. Okay? All right? A work of faith is a work that proves someone exercised, they exercise faith in the Lord Jesus. That, that's, that's real key for salvation. A person that have committed their life to the Lord and opened their heart to the Lord and start following the Lord is declaring, is declaring a work of faith in the Lord Jesus. Okay? I'm going to put up here exercise. Faith. In Jesus. Okay? Exercise faith in Jesus. Uh, it also, it is, uh, it is a work that declares faith in the heart. Now, I want to talk about some of these just briefly. Um, that declares faith in the heart. You remember the, the man that Paul... The Bible says that Paul discerned that he had faith to what? Be healed. See? He had faith. Now, according to the book of Romans, faith comes by what? 
Hearing what? Okay. And faith is where? 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 Faith is in the heart. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, faith is in your heart. It's not up here. It's not out here. It is in here. Faith is in your heart. Now, many of you could recognize and understand this, that, that when faith drops in your heart for something, you don't have to, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you see it. You see it without it even being formed as of yet. When I sat in my chair this morning, I looked at my garden, and, and there was faith rising up in my heart to get it clean. I saw, I saw in my garden romaine lettuce. I saw spinach. I'm, I'm just telling you. Because what I, what I, what I used to exercise is this. I, I encourage myself. You got to look. Guys, listen. You remember David? David had to encourage himself in the Lord when they had come and took all their stuff and the people that he, that was giving their life for him and he was giving their life for them, they were now against him because they had took all their stuff, took their wives and children. And the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes you got to encourage yourself. And what I used to do to encourage myself in my garden, I'll take a picture when it looks like a jungle. I'll get out there and I'll take a picture. And then when it's at the prime of harvest, I'll take another picture. And I'll look at both those pictures and I'll say, praise the Lord. Man, can, listen, guys, can I, can I get you to understand what I'm talking about? You have to sometimes put before your eyes that which you are believing God for. You got to get, listen, you got to get this in your understanding. If the Lord, listen, and, and, I, and I got those scriptures here. If the Lord has said it, you need to now begin, listen, because I'm going to deal with the reason why I'm dealing with a work of faith and trying to get you to understand that now. For when we go to James, and James talks about, you show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. We need to understand that. And we need to understand that Romans come back and said, we are justified by faith alone and not works. You need to understand that that's not a contradiction. It actually means we are justified by faith and not the works of the law. Just to kind of give you a taste of what that understanding is, okay? So, what is a work of faith? So, so that's what we're talking about. That's what we're dealing with. Now, um, faith in the heart. This does not mean a work of your own producing faith, but a work which showed that you had faith. See, a lot of us try to get out here and we put a lot of effort into trying to produce faith. Thank you all for your quietness because that let me know you all listening. Now, what do I mean when I say that? We, we try to get a positive confession about something that we need. And you know, sometimes we have a positive confession about something that we need when God has already promised you that which you're trying to shake the trees for. And all you have to do is find out what his word says about that and begin to declare and decree that. But listen, faith without works is faith without corresponding action is dead. Faith without activity is dead. You see that? Action, a deed, activity. In other words, what God has declared, okay, and you declare, it needs to flow together to be a work of faith. Okay? You, you with me? Come on, let me, let me kind of close this up with this. What do you believe in God for? Let me ask that question. And I'm asking that question, as soon as I find my handkerchief here, I'm asking that question, got it, for you to say something. 
Now, you, I want you to say it, and I'm going to say it on the mic so we get it on the CD. And I don't want you to all be, tell it to me all at once. And it doesn't have to be all of you. I just need a few of you. What are you believing God for? Okay, all right. I must be, I must be amongst unbelievers because y'all just froze. Mr. Kia, believe in God for a car. A what? Who? Somebody? Who said that? No. Finances. A van. Van and growth through your business. Family salvation. A what? A baby boy? I know what he said, Sis Crystal. I'm, you know I'm getting ready to dig at this. <laughs> okay, so, so you did talk to Miss Latoya about this. I, I'm just trying to clarify some things. And she did agree together with you, a baby boy. Okay, I heard her say yes, so I just forget about it. Okay, so we okay now. Okay, okay. Sister Diane, you had something. What you believe in God for? All right, that's what she believe in God for. Yes, ma'am. Transitional center. Okay. All right. Missionary, you got something, I see. What you believe in God for? I believe in God for writing books. Writing books. Very good. Okay, now, listen to me as we close our time together. If you are believing the Lord for something, it must be, first of all, from God's word. Now, let's revisit. <laughs> She's over here believing God. For writing. Now, now, guys, listen. I'm going to give you the end of my message, and, and I want you, because I want to encourage you and build your faith. The end of the message is this. Put up Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man. Oh, come on. I'll tell you what. Let's all read it together. Come on. Ready? Read. God, that he should lie, nor a son of a man, that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Oh, I'm telling you, you don't know how that's a good word. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he'll make it good. You see, that's what I'm talking about, okay? So let's revisit the book. Has God spoke about the book? Probably he has. See? That's a work of faith. It has to be, it has to be ingrained in God's word for this transitional center. It, listen, a lot of us, because of the anointing upon this house, a lot of us see, and, and, and we don't understand it yet, we see that we need resources and certain things in the community. It's because of the anointing of God that's here. We see sinners. We see buildings raising up out of the ground. We see a sinner to have missionaries come and, and be refreshed and have people come and be taught and have folks rise up in this area and, and, and undergird them and sow them out to the world. We see all that because of the anointing in this house. But we got to see it as a work of faith. And first of all, it has to be ingrained in God's word. Because, why? Because if he said it, he is going to do it. And if he spoke it, he's going to make it good. Now, a lot of times we approach God from the need standpoint. And we try our best to convince God that we have the need. We'll even go before God with the mully grubs about the need. Oh, God, Lord, you know, oh, I need a van so bad, Lord, carrying all these children around. Oh, Lord, oh. That, I mean, you know, we do that. Does not the word say he know what you need before you ask? 
Now, now that doesn't mean you shouldn't ask because it has in the verse. He knows what you need before you ask, meaning you ask. But I'm telling you, listen, this may be, man, and I just, I just don't like using the word old because it's not old. It is one of the most refreshing things that come with age. And this is this. You don't dilly-dally with a lot of junk. You know, listen, I'm telling you, listen. After you've been around a while, that's all you interested in is a work of faith. Because you know nothing else matters. I, you know, I can't tell you how many times Sister Diane approached me about, Pastor, we, 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 we need a building in the back over here, you know, a storage area. I ain't interested in a storage area. Now, trust me, she is right. We do need it. Okay? But what I'm interested in is a work of faith. And as God brings the resources, then I don't, I don't have to exercise faith for our storage building. It'll come up. With the rest of all these buildings that we see and understand and, and know that God has commanded to come up out of the ground. Hallelujah. But first of all, it has to be, what? From God's word. You have to agree with God's word concerning that area. What does God's word say about it? Okay. So Floyd back here is agreeing for a van. I don't, I don't think I read anything about a van in the Word. But I know what I have read, that he'll supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen? Are oh, you listening to me? Sometimes we present to, lo to the Lord your, your wishful list. Don't present wishful list to God. Don't do wishful thinking to God. Don't present it to him. Amen? Present something to him in faith. Faith. Faith of what he has said. Are you listening to me? And so it has to be from God's word, agree with God's word, and you have to receive God's word for it. Sometimes that is a real problem. Because sometimes his word is a whole lot different than what you're trying to believe for. And if you don't receive it, if you don't receive it, then it doesn't come. If I want to give Sis Maisha a gift, let's just say she's working and she needs a car. And the Lord put it on my heart, give her a car. And I get to Maisha, I call up on the phone, I said, Maya, I'm coming to see you, girl. Got a gift for you. Oh, Pastor, thank you. Whatever it is, I'm going to take it in the name of Jesus. I could hear, you know, she'd be going off on the phone, yeah. <laughs> and I get over there and I say, My, look, there's your car. And she looked at it and she said, Well, you know, Pastor, I don't want that. I said, My, it's a gift to you. It runs perfectly. It looks good. It's all yours. It even got your name on the title. It's yours. I don't want that. What, what is she telling me? She doesn't want it. What is she actually saying? I will not receive this. And trust me, with God, if you, if you don't learn how to receive, it won't come. Did y'all hear what I just said? Some of us don't realize how we operate in pride. And the deeper you are a giver, the more susceptible you are to operate in pride. This is what I mean by that. I mean, you're a deep giver, and you look for ways to give, and you'll give to your hurt. But when somebody tries to bless you, I don't need that. You don't say those words. No, no, I don't need it. I don't, I don't need it. And I mean hurting for something. You see, you're not understanding the principle. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Does that not work in that manner? And here you are with your prideful self. Don't want to take it. Don't want to take it. And then, you see how, how open Miss Maisa is? And then we get greedy. 
Uh-huh, yeah, we know it. And I want you to remember one thing. Remember one story when we talk about greed. The nation of Israel prayed so much, cried out to God so much for meat. And God said that there's coming a time I'm going to send you some quail, and you're going to eat it till it come out of your nostrils. Just to let you know, not only that I can do it, but I, I need to wean you off and you get some understanding concerning a work of faith. Amen. Now, um, let's see if I can put this over here. Okay, so first of all, what I'll do is I won't put that up. I'll highlight it again and put it on the board again. But let me give you a couple scriptures and I'm done, okay? Can you stay with me? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, it has to, first of all, it must be from God's word, agree with God's word, receive God's word. Romans 4.13. Look at it. Romans 4.13. Now, you need to be copying this down because it's not on the board. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Through the righteousness of faith. He was declared righteous by God. And when God declares something, it is what he declared it to be. Hmm? Look at verse 19, beginning at verse 19 through verse 21. Go there. And Abraham wasn't weak in faith. What does that mean, he wasn't weak in faith? See? Yeah, see? He, he was strong, meaning you can be weak in faith. Does it not mean that? You can be weak in faith. He did not consider his own body. In other words, he didn't look at the circumstances inside of him. Because he was looking at God's promise. God said to him, you will be heir of the world. Okay, do you think, Lord, you know what you're talking about? I'm 100. And when you're dealing with heirs, that means somebody is going to be my blood child and my wife is barren and she's 90. Did you think he had reason to be weak in faith if he wanted to go there? Yes, he did. But he wasn't weak. He wasn't weak in faith, and he didn't consider what was on the inside of him already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not consider what was trying to operate on his thinking concerning what God said, and he did not consider what was operating on his thinking outside of him. Verse 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. And that's a place sometimes we find ourselves because we begin to look at how great the problem is and not how big your God is. I'm going to go back to what we said earlier. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he'll make it good. Did not waver. Unbelief causes you to waver. You're in and you're out. One day you believe, the next day you don't. You're in and out. You're wavering. You're wavering. And what causes you to waver? What actually causes you to waver is what we minister to you in verse 19 about how he wasn't weak in faith, how he didn't you know, consider those things on the inside of him as well as the things on the outside. Because a lot of times when God speaks something about something, it's not, it doesn't look like what he spoke about. God dropped this bit of wisdom in my heart concerning things, and he spoke to me about it, and he said, you need to get this into people because they are going to go through some difficult things. And this was the word he dropped in my heart about. Some of you may have remembered me saying it, but nothing is as serious as it first seemed. Say that with me. Nothing is as serious as it first seemed. What does that mean? That means this. 
Something's going to show up. Sometimes I have shown up. That's just downright serious. And it's not as serious as it first seemed. Now, the reason why the Spirit of God gave me that, because he had to give me some understanding about that, says Carolyn. I didn't understand what he meant, but this is what he meant. When you begin to trust and rest in the Lord and begin to put your faith on that situation, I'm telling you, it starts to decrease. You settle down. You know, you've been running around like a chicken with your head cut off. You settle down. You pick your head up off the floor. You put it back on your body, just so to speak, praise the Lord. And you begin to exercise some word over that circumstance. And then all of a sudden, it's negotiable. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't seem as serious. Then all of a sudden, things begin to change. And when that happens, begin to put your trust and all your weight on what God has said. Because sometimes the situation may get worse. That's only what you see. We must be, we have to be strong in faith because of what God has called us to. 21. He was fully convinced that what God had promised. That don't have nothing to do with you. Man, that is strong. It's got an anointing on it. Abraham was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. This thing is on the ability of God and not your giftedness. It's on the ability of God and not who you are. It's on the ability of God and not where you've been. It's on the ability of God and not your word. It is on his ability. His ability. His ability. Hallelujah. His ability. Oh, man. I apologize for the time, but let me get this in. Let me get this in. Put up 2 Corinthians 8, 7. 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Read this with me. Ready? Read. You know, I'm so amazed. Yeah, yeah, listen to me. I want, now, all eyes up at Look at me. Look at everybody. You see, that's why God gives you pastors. <laughs> Y'all need a shepherd, I'm telling you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Y'all ready? Let's read. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in disgrace also. Now, the point about it, the first point about this thing, if you are believing the Lord for something, it must be from God's word. You have to agree with God's word. You have to receive God's word, but it also must abound in you. Our problem is we are too lazy. We think that if we have said it once, it's done. No, no, my good sister and brother. If God said it, it's done. Oh, but we are not God. That means this thing has to abound in you. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror. Put it up there, God's word. Rehearse it in your heart. When somebody talks to you about it, talk it up with them. I'm believing God for this. God has said this, and I believe him. Talk it up. It's got to abound in you. Stop being lazy. Put your effort into it. You did it for your job. You did it messing around with somebody else. Man, you listen. You listen. You work. You didn't have any money, but your pal called you and say, let's go over to CC's and have some coffee. And you found some money under your seat in your car. You dug in your seats. You look in your glove box. You look in your ashtray. You found the money to get over there to CC's and buy a cup of coffee with your friend. Why can't you put that kind of effort in believing God? For what you need. 
It has to abound in you. Let me, let me review this. Did you give me something you were believing in? You didn't, huh? You did? What'd you get? A baby boy. Do I really need to go there? I just got instructions to use somebody else. But I don't obey instructions. Praise the Lord. Uh, I, I know what you're talking about, brother, because, look, I told my wife. I told my wife. I told her. But, but see, I didn't have as much faith as you have. I waited till she got pregnant. <laughs> when she got pregnant, I told her, I said, I'm believing God for a girl. And I said, I believe that we're going to have a girl. That's what I said. And guess what it was? It was a girl. Guess what I said the second time around? I'm believing God for a boy. And the word of God abounded. I had two boys. Amen. I'm serious. And then the third time, I, you know, now the third time was a surprise, okay? I'll be perfectly honest with you. I said the third time, Lord. Whichever one, let it be healthy. Praise the Lord. And trust me, it sure was. <laughs> it sure was. I'm telling you. She was pregnant the third time. Well, she was pregnant the second time with twins. The third time, you could have swore she had triplets. It's just a big baby. Of course, if you've seen Josh, you'll know why. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But you see, listen, guys. Remember, a work of faith takes action. Joy in Latoya is not going to have a boy without action. It just ain't going to happen. They could talk all they want. It ain't going to happen. You see that? See, see right here? See that? That's exactly right. You see, this is why I'm talking to you about when it comes uh, dealing with a word from God, it has to abound in you guys because, you see, you're letting other stuff abound in you. And a lot of times it's not a faith. It's junk. And it'll bring you some success. All this other junk you're letting abound in you. You with me? Mm, hallelujah. Okay, you must ask based on God's word. Now, that's, that's different. One has to be from God's word, but you have to ask based on God's word. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. Amen. Six. But let him ask what? In faith. Let him ask in faith. With no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 7. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. And then verse 8. He is a double-minded man. And notice what he, he's not unstable in what he is wavering back and forth. With God, he's unstable in all his ways because your faith does matter. You with me? Okay. All right. Two more scriptures. Sometimes, sometimes we wonder if God will do what he said he will do. We know from Numbers 23, 19, put it back up there, Joe. 23, 19, he's not a man that he should lie. He's not the son of man that he should repent, as he said, and will he not do. you got to get that principle. You need to mark this scripture down. you got to get this in your spirit. That's the important thing about it. you got to get this in your spirit. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Does not the word say about God's word that it will not return unto him void? That means without function, without power but it will accomplish what he sent it to do. This is God's word. 
And this is why you can stretch out on faith because he, if he said it, he'll do it. He spoke it. He'll make it good. Psalms 33, 9. I love this one. This one goes along with it. You see it? You see it. What does it say? Ready, read. Mm -hmm. Grab a hold of that. I wish I had time to give you plenty of examples because, I mean, that's what the Word of God is. The Word of God is simply God spoke it and it was done. If he told them that you will not see the land flowing with milk and honey, trust me, they wasn't going to see it. If he said it, I don't care what it looks like. In time, in your season, I'm going to bring you to the place I told you about. Trust me, he's going to bring you. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded it. It stood fast. It didn't need legs. It didn't need to be propped up. It didn't need to be held up. I'm telling you, when he commanded it, I'm telling you, it stood on thin air, very air. Nothing could pull it down. Do you realize that the mantles of God, that God places mantles on people, that they don't, the mantles don't go to heaven. The man will stay in the earth. And they will stay in the earth till somebody gets some faith and the calling of God on their life to recognize the calling on God to grab a hold of that. You hear what I'm telling you? It's in the earth. God lets them stay in the earth. An example is with Elijah. Did he, did he, did he, not, uh, did he not have his, uh, the man will fall on Elisha? Didn't he? It didn't go to heaven. Elijah went to heaven. His mantle stayed in the earth for somebody else to pick up. And, and now listen, here, here, is a, here is a principle you, you must also catch. God will give you what you need, but what he expects out of you is to develop it further. This is where we make a mistake. Because we settle on just what God gives us when he hasn't settled on just giving you that. He's giving it to you so that now you can declare and decree and work with this thing and make it better. Because if he wouldn't give it to you, you wouldn't have it, first of all. You wouldn't even have the opportunity to work with it, deal with it, or whatever. But he'll give you, he'll, he'll, he'll give you the remnants of a business for you now to grab a hold of that thing and begin to employ faith concerning that thing, believing him, listening to him all the way so that every step of the way, it's a work of faith. Every step, every step. Now, you see, this is the thing. The thing is, we get so much in a hurry. We want it in so much of a hurry. If you do it according to a work of faith, then you'll have the time to focus on and to occupy and to abound in the thing that God has said and stop trying to abound in all of all this because that's what we try to do. And that's where the enemy wears us out. You don't realize that the enemy will wear us out even when it comes to the word of God for our lives. Because he'll feed you stuff. The moment the enemy sniffs out pride in your life, he'll begin to feed you stuff Amen. concerning that thing that you have pride about. If you have pride that you can pray, the enemy will begin to feed you stuff concerning that just to get you off of that. That's why you got to stay in the things of God. That's why you, you, got, you got to stay there. You got to stay there. You got to recognize these things in you, and you have to confess them to God and keep this thing straight and keep this thing whole before God. This is not hard. All it is, all it means is that you just got to have a heart for the Lord. That you, just, you just got to. And the Holy Ghost will remind you, okay, you're out. You're out. Get back in. Yeah, you know God told you this. Yeah, but look where you are. I, I told you I wanted to bless this street. 
And now you all the way up in North Louisiana. Well, pastor, doesn't God want big things? But of course, he's a big God. But let him say it. And, and you can develop it. You can develop it. You can develop it. He's given you the ability and the creativity to develop it. But just make sure you follow him all the way. He will cause you to develop it. But you've got to follow him. Amen? Amen. Last scripture. You know what it is, Joe, the last one on the page. Thank you. You see it, Joe? So Jesus answered and said to them, Go ahead, go ahead. All right, on three. One, two, three. Say it again. 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 See, sometimes you got to reel in disobedient children. It actually means have the faith of God. Now, just think just for a moment. You, you can close everything up. I'm, I'm done. But just think for a moment. Uh, Joe, put up, uh, put, put uh, num numbers 23, what is it, 2311? Put that back up there. I want you to just think for a moment. Just, just venture with me in your mind, okay? Has he said and will he not do? I want you to just think for me for a moment. Everything you say would come to pass. Just think. Come on. Come on. You, 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 have a, you have a real capable mind. Think about that. Think about it for a moment. Everything you said this week would come to pass. What would it look like? Would it look like a mess? Or would it be a message? Would it be disastrous or would it be divine? Mm -hmm. No, but of course, Brother Joe, is going to be divine. Look what you're believing for, a boy. Okay, that went over your head. Okay, very good. That's good. You're focused. That's good. <laughs> Come on, stand to your feet with me. <laughs> 